we're extremely pleased to be able to start with Professor Grace Edwards, who's the Professor of Midwifery at the Aga Khan University in Uganda. And she is speaking from Uganda. Grace Edwards, over to you. So as Neil said, my name is Grace Edwards. I'm Professor of Midwifery based in Uganda, but working across East Africa. Aga Khan University has three campuses, one in Kenya, one in Tanzania, and one in Uganda, where I'm based. But I actually work across the three countries. And what I'd like to do over the next five or 10 minutes is just give you some perspective on the effect of COVID on education for nurses and midwives in Uganda and the effect in Uganda generally. So just to tell you a little bit more about Uganda, Uganda is a landlocked country and the equator straddles the equator. So the equator is right in the middle. They're also, it's a very young population here and they're all very keen football fans. And it's very nice for me to see that uh, Liverpool is a favorite fan favourite team, especially seeing as I'm from Liverpool originally. It's also the home of the gorillas, the um, mountain gorillas. There's very few of them left, but it's an amazing sight to see. And this is a picture I found of one who'd just given birth. And giving birth is a common thing in Uganda. The fertility rate is around 5.9 for women. And these are some of my students from this year. And out of a class of 23, five of them had babies during the course. And very different to the UK or to the West, they actually come back to work immediately. So they come back with the babies, often traveling overnight to get to school because they're so keen to learn. So this is a common sight of a picture of me holding a baby while giving a class in, um, in Uganda, which is something I like very much. Okay, now as a leader, I see my role very much as being hands-on. So in Uganda, I've always worked clinically and kept my clinical competence. So I actually work clinically in Uganda as well with the students and for my own uh, competence as well. And the hospital I work is called Kawempi National Referral Hospital. It's um, the biggest hospital I've ever seen in my life. Quite a new hospital, but when you get inside, you'll see the challenges that we have here. There's around 26,000 births a year, so about 100 a day. And um, it was a big challenge to me when I first got here. So just to give you some idea of what it looks like inside, this is a common site in sub-Saharan African hospitals because the facilities, although they're quite new, don't have the capacity to deal with the number of births. So about 200 women a day attend for antenatal care. And as I said, about 100 deliveries a day. So it's, it's really, really busy. And as you can see, social distancing would be very difficult here. This is the neonatal unit, which is always around 300% over-occupied. So we have to make do with whatever we can in order to look after the babies as well as it can be done here. Now the government response to COVID here was very swift because they realized that um, a COVID outbreak on the, the, the size and scale of what's happened in the West would be very, very dangerous here. So we had a complete border lockdown from the middle of March. So even before the first case was identified here and we had no private cars, we weren't allowed to drive, no public transport. The airport's now been closed for about six months. And we started off with a curfew from 5 till 7 a.m. Uh, now it's, it went to 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And just this last week, it's gone till 9 p.m., which has really made a difference in being able to, to walk around and be out. What the government did here was make it a criminal offence not to wear a mask. You actually can get six months in prison. So it's a very interesting difference to um, some of the things I'm hearing from the West. But unfortunately, the universities and schools have also been closed for about five months. Now, this work by Bell gives you some idea of what the impact of COVID would have, particularly on maternal mortality here. Um, today, we've just gone over the 3000 cases. So still relatively small number of cases with 30 deaths. But when you look at the effects of, um, of the lockdown and COVID on maternal mortality, maternity mortality, particularly, it's a big challenge. So there's only one ICU bed for, for a million of the population here. And before COVID, the maternal mortality was 336 per 100,000 births. And what we found is one of the big pressures we have is to try and encourage women to deliver it within a hospital facility so that we at least have the facilities to look after them and they're not delivering with um, an untrained uh, birth attendant. But we've seen a reduction of 29% of facility deliveries in March compared with January of this year. And that's around 28% less facility deliveries for the 12 month average for 2019. 
The other worrying thing we found is an 82% increase in maternal mortality, which went up from 92 deaths to 167 deaths over the same period from around about March, which was an increase of 87% from the 12 months uh, from last year, which is really worrying. One of the challenges we have here is transport. And uh, this is some pictures of um, mobile ambulances that are used, particularly in the rural areas, to try and get women to a facility if we can do so. But again, it's been very, very difficult. Okay, so from my perspective as a leader, I'm very keen that if we're not building leaders, then we're, we're not leading, you're following. So what I'm trying to do here, or what my aspirations are, is to help develop um, some very, very good midwives, some of the best student midwives I've ever worked with in my life, because they're so committed to learn and so committed to, to work and to, and to develop. And they've all been working clinically throughout COVID, as well as um, working online with school. So I think it's very much about inspiring the, the, the students that we have here. And just to finish, this is a picture of my first group of students and four of these had babies the, throughout the course. And every single one of these groups are now in a leadership position. So hopefully they're going to be able to, um, to develop midwifery and develop care for women, particularly under these challenging circumstances. So how we've responded to COVID as a university, the university is still closed. So we're actually doing all our Zoom lessons online. And one of the challenges we have for the students is they, they can't afford to buy data. So the university buys all students data bundles so they can access online dis discussions. We use WhatsApp as a discussion uh, forum. And we also use um, an online platform called Mo Moodle, which everything is pasted on, all the talks, all the, the discussions, all the papers are pasted onto there so students can access them. We're still not allowed to do any clinical teaching because the hospitals are all under, under strict quarantine. And, but we've all been trained on inline teaching and assessment, and I'm now becoming an expert at teaching on Zoom, although I couldn't get my slides up, but it's been a great challenge. <laughs> okay, so thank you, and I'll be welcome to hear some questions from you. Okay, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Hannah Darling, who's going to be the first speaker, who's going to speak about birth at the time of COVID-19, which you know, birth carries on whatever goes on in the rest of the world. Uh, and mo many of you will know of Hannah. If you're a tweeter, you'll know about Hannah. And if you're a midwife, you'll know about Hannah. Um, and so we're so thrilled that she's joining us from Australia today. She's a professor of midwifery and discipline leader of midwifery and associate dean, I don't know how you fit all that in Hannah, in the School of Nursing and Midwifery. She's been a midwife for 30 years and still practices. And in fact, I'm sure she'll share with you, but she's in where she practices, which is fantastic. She's a prolific publisher. And she, in 2019, she was awarded a member of the Order of Australia, which is a huge honor. That's the AM after her name in the Queen's Birthday Honours list for her significant service to midwifery, nursing and medical education and research. Um, and she's obviously a very influential and wonderful person. But I don't want to say any more. Her bio, just as all the speakers' bios, are available online. So please do visit there as well. So welcome, Hannah. We're thrilled you're with us. The floor is yours. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much, um, Sue. And thank you for that very warm welcome and I sure hope I live up to uh, to that. I'm just going to share slides now so hopefully that all looks good for you all the way from Australia. The delay hopefully hasn't happened um, and I'm from you know New South Wales so I'm from that other Wales which we were actually named after you so it feels like there's a, a real connection with with us um, today and uh, as um, Sue said I'm in my consulting room as well as my my office so uh, this is real it's not one of those you know fake images that uh, get put up this is me in the raw so I'm really honoured to um, be talking to you today about birth in the time of COVID. Uh, this is a study that has basically grown, like so many things this year, where we've moved at the rate of knots. Um, the virus has shown us our capacity, shown us our innovation. And um, I don't know about any of you, but I have never been busier in my life. 
and um, it's a different kind of busy though. So I want to talk a bit about our study, but I also want to talk about some provoking things around human rights as well. So what a year has it been? We began our year full of fire and smoke and we are probably heading back into that season now. Uh, we then had this little virus that came and basically managed to stop the world. We learned different ways of trying to connect with each other. I frankly miss the hugging and the kissing. I sure hope we haven't forgotten how to do that when we come back to that possibility. We saw some fairly devastating glimpses as to what birth might be when it initially came out um, in China. We learned that masks be can become a fashion icon and, um, you know, it's quite extraordinary what you see people doing with their masks. And, of course, we saw the aviation industry virtually come to a standstill. Uh, it's been an extraordinary year and I'm sure in history, um, in years to come, we're going to reflect on this year. And I'm hoping we learn lessons, both the good and the bad, because I want to point out both today because I think there has been some good and I think we need to acknowledge that and learn from that as, as humans. So connection, as Brene Brown says, is what we are here, why we are here, we are hardwired to connect with others. And as humans, we need connection. And so what has happened in 2020 has really challenged that in ways that in our living memory, we have not experienced, even though we do know there have been other times in history where this um, connection has been severed. But in our time in history, we have not had this happen to the extent that we have seen in 2020. However, in our time in history, um, we do have all those wonderful things like social media and the ability to be connected all over the world in conferences like this. So we're also extraordinarily lucky um, to be at this point in history with this um, pandemic happening. But having a baby, as all of you would know listening, whether you're mothers or whether you're midwives or whether you're other maternity health workers, is when this need for connection is at its highest. So what's happening out there? What's happening now and what are the potential implications for the future? And that's what we are really interested in looking at in our birth in the time of COVID study, otherwise affectionately known as hashtag BITOC, for those of you who are into the, the world of hashtags. So it isn't known how COVID-19 will affect pregnant women, uh, new mothers, babies, midwives, midwifery students within those health systems dealing with the pandemic. And we're making decisions with little idea as to the long-term consequences and we're also making decisions in a medicalized patriarchal framework and I want to address both of these in my talk today. So we have a patchwork of inconsistent policies. Um, we, I, I'm sure it's similar that you had the same happening in the UK but we First of all, you know, you could only have one support person in some hospitals. You could have two support people. Uh, there were people sneaking support people up back corridors, hiding them under, under drapes. There was a whole bunch of variation going on. We had hospitals one kilometre away from each other that had different rules. We had huge PPE variations. Um, in some of the interviews I've been doing with midwives, there was even the good PPE was reserved for the doctors and the other PPE went to the midwives. So we've started to reveal some very interesting things in our allocation. We had no partners at ultrasounds and, you know, that actually ended up being a very big deal when women were being told their baby was no longer alive and they had no one to share that with. Uh, we offered on one hand and restricted on the other water birth. You know, we even had a hospital in New South Wales when Victoria blew up. And as you will all know, Victoria's had a second wave. There was a restriction on water birth, which I don't think was logical, but what was really illogical was the fear that then permeated into New South Wales where people started putting tape around the bath nozzles to stop water birth happening. So we've had the shutdown and the expansion of birth centres. Our, our only freestanding birth centre in New South Wales was turned into a COVID clinic. Um, we've closed home birth programs and we've expanded home birth programs. And meanwhile, there's been about a tripling in the um, seeking of home birth from women. You know, we've argued for skin to skin, we've argued against it, we've argued the baby should be breastfed, we've argued that they shouldn't be. So this is a, we've got this patchwork of inconsistent policies and the results confusion and potential trauma for women and their partners and not to mention the midwives who I see as the go-between 
the policy makers and the women and their partners. And that's sometimes incredibly stressful. So the aim of our study was to explore the experience of women uh, who were giving birth and managing those early days and months of motherhood during the COVID pandemic, as well as to look at midwifery students and midwives providing this care. And we started off with a small idea and it just kept growing. So we began with a, a, a small kind of New South Wales Victoria team, uh, and that was the Sphere team. We got a small grant. We were very excited. And then people like Professor Sue Kilday and Professor Suzanne King, who ran the big, the big flood studies, the Canadian ice storm studies, contacted us and said, hey, could we be involved? We think we could really really be part of this team and let's follow up what's happening to children who are when their mothers are pregnant and birthing during this time and so a huge team of psychologists psychiatrists um, obstetricians aboriginal um, workers because we want to look at aboriginal women particularly refugee women and migrant women and we just kept growing and we're now applying for more money to hopefully keep going and then new zealand joined us um, so new zealand had been the envy of the world and done incredibly well and I still think they are the envy of the world and of course they had a second wave and so now they're they're doing um, exactly the same study in New Zealand which is really exciting. I think one of the great things that's come out of COVID-19 is we've come out of our silos as researchers and we've all decided we need to work together and we're not hunkering down and going don't you look at my homework or my exam paper because you know you might steal my ideas. So the methodology is very much a mixed methods. We've done in-depth interviews with women across Australia, 18 women, 17 midwives, midwifery students, 10 midwifery students. We've also got this really innovative part of this study, which is called the Vocal App, which my brilliant PhD student Hazel Keedle has designed, where women just daily, weekly record into an app and all their data gets uploaded and we analyse that. And we've got seven women recording all through their pregnancy about how they feel and what they're experiencing. And we've also then launched the large pregnancy and postpartum survey, two months postpartum survey, and we've had over 5,000 women respond um, to that, which has been a mind blowing. And we're about to launch the six month follow up survey. So what did midwives tell us? Well, midwives told us that there were so many questions and so few answers at the beginning. Um, you know, Am I giving the women the right information? I knew my MIDI stuff, that's fine. I keep women safe, but I had no idea. Women were asking me, do I need to go to work? Can I go to work? I'm working in early childhood. I'm a high risk pregnancy. I was really anxious. I, I don't know what to say. And we were given some information, but was it actually correct? We didn't have a lot of infinite information. So there's a lot of anxieties around that. I'm sure many midwives out there are nodding their heads with this one. And then another, you know, the anxiety of those first few weeks, um, they didn't know what to do. Is it going to work? Is it right? But then midwives sort of then really went into this. OK, now let's switch on another way of thinking about this. Let's let's calm down. Let's, you know, get on with the job. And it was interesting. I would describe the first wave that we experienced mostly in New South Wales. In fact, it all began about one kilometre from where I live and my husband works in the hospital where it all began. I think in that first wave, it was high anxiety and everyone was running on adrenaline. And when Melbourne hit, the midwives have said to us, we just went from stress to, to depression because it was like, how much longer can we keep this going? So midwives said they're constantly apologising, apologising to women, trying to find out why information has changed, trying to relay it. And it just was this constant feeling of, of, of running behind and um, being the meat in the sandwich between management and directives and women. Uh, so a huge amount of stress. I do think we, and I know Billy will so beautifully talk about this, but I do think that when it's all over and done, I can see trauma emerging for midwives and we need to be there for them and we need to make sure that we hold them up because they've done the most incredible job in the year that was supposed to be our year. We were supposed to be looked after in 2020 and we've done the looking after. So let's let's not forget that they still need looking after when we finish. 
PPE, as, as I've already described, huge variations on how people use them on what was accessible. For example, we're going to publish a study very shortly looking at privately practicing midwives. And, you know, those midwives had to go to Bunnings uh, hardware store to get it. They even if they had visiting rights or clinical arrangements with hospitals, they were denied PPE. And then the most beautiful thing happened, which is consumers who went out and bought them PPE and dropped them at their doorsteps. So we saw some lovely acts, but also some real concern about how we view certain uh, activities of midwives and COVID worries. You know, I know when it first hit and my husband was coming home from the hospital where it was all blowing up, you know, I said, go sleep in another bed for a while. <laughs> because there was this real concern and then he used to come home he used to shower at work bring his clothes home put them in the washing machine so we've reorientated so much about how we function as as people with our families as well as within the workplace so what could management have done better and the, the midwives have said you know more kindness more calmness more effort in making us calm really putting more effort into being positive and supporting us with calmness. We were doing an absolutely brilliant job. When you walk around and you put your staff down for standing too close together, that's just bullshit. We don't pull punches in Australia. So there was just no effort to boost morale and rally around to everybody together and say, we're, doing, we're going to be okay. And I was thinking sometimes we just need a pep talk, you know, a decent pep, pep talk. And there was this really interesting struggle that midwives went through and really feeling that they can't stop being midwives. So here's a, here's a midwife telling a story and she says, I'm a midwife, this stuff isn't going to stop the way I deliver care. You know, I had a woman who at 20 weeks after countless miscarriages, she had just gotten to 20 weeks, her cervix was shortening and opening, they could see the bulging forward is right. She and her husband were devastated. I knew I was breaking the 1.5 metre rule. I got in and I hugged them both. Like, I can't stop being human in this. I can't, you know, I didn't go into midwifery to say I'm so sorry behind a mask. You know, whether that was the right decision or the wrong decision, I don't know, but I would do it again. A lot of midwives I know take the same view that you're a midwife because you actually, you know, your philosophies align to it and you give a damn about women. And we heard some amazing stories of midwives who at that moment of crisis pulled that mask down to connect with people because they found it just so wrong to have that barrier between them. So what did women tell us? Well, we asked them, at what point during your pregnancy were things the worst in months? And it's really quite fascinating when you look at this graph and you've got the obvious peak that happened, you know, in April particularly, and then dying down in May. And then we got our second wave, um, which was August. So this is the months that the women found uh, that were worst for them. And they very much mirror what was going on in Australia. And we asked them, have you ever suspected you or anyone else you've known personally has had COVID? And you can see a huge number of pregnant women. You know, we're talking about nearly 800 pregnant women suspected or felt that they knew someone who'd had COVID. And then we asked them if they'd been tested. And it's around 900 pregnant women in, the, in this study sample had been tested. And then we asked them, had you got a positive result? And five out of that whole number. And while that's a good thing, thank goodness, that's a great thing, the amount of stress that has been caused. And what's that doing to that growing baby? What's that doing to that family? What are the potential ripples that are coming out of this? So telehealth has been a fascinating thing for me. And I found in the interviews and in the survey some really interesting things happening. So, so this woman, you know, talks about a particular hospital doing a shit job. I've only had one physical examination and one telehealth and the telehealth, they couldn't get me off the phone fast enough. And another woman who said, I'm very satisfied there was no telehealth. So some models of care continued as business as usual, often continuity of midwifery models and others only women had two face-to-face -face visits their whole pregnancy. And women talked about, you know, the remote visits are hard. No one appears to be checking up on me. And this woman said, I haven't had a face-to-face -face visit with a midwife yet, not until I'm 28 weeks. And what women said in the interviews, and, and I would ask them, how does the midwife speak to you? You know, are the midwives asking you about how you're going, what's going on with your family? And I know when I have women in, in my office, I spend 50 minutes of my one-hour appointment with them talking or listening, chatting about life, dealing with questions and anxieties. And then we have 10 minutes where we do them, the baby, heart and the blood pressure and everything. 
But what's happened is even in continuity care models, midwives are cutting to the chase. They're going straight into how's your baby? Is it moving? You know, here's your plan. This is what you need to do. And midwives have started to shelve the psychological support. Now, I find that fascinating. We're in a time where we didn't ever have to depend on telehealth as we do now. And I think we haven't prepared adequately to help midwives maximise this particular resource in this time. Continuity of care has very much come out in the um, study as a buffer. It's an absolute buffer. And here's this woman who I interviewed who said she went to hospital, she was shoved in a room, the isolation bay to be, you know, have all the screenings done. Her husband was removed from her. She was in pain. She was distressed. She was calling out. Nobody would come near her. And then her midwife walked in and she said, I just fell into my midwife's arms and everything was right from that moment on. And she very much talked about having a midwife who I could go to was like holding me up in a storm. So how do we really use telehealth? Now, all of the images when I went on the internet look like this. They look really warm and friendly and personal and there's faces and look at this doctor. He's, he's even zooming out of the screen to do a physical check. So they all symbolize connection and intimacy and functioning. However, the reality in Australia, and I don't know what it is in the UK, is most of it's been on the phone. It's not been about seeing people. It's been on a phone and it looks very different to this. Now, I I'm the first to say I think there are some people who really do benefit and like telehealth. I think there are groups of people who prefer not to have face to face or prefer not to have to come into the busy hospitals or have mental health issues that they actually are getting more engaged by using this medium. But I also think for many, many women who are pregnant, not having that personal that person in there and that face face to face and eye to eye contact is altering some of the way we provide care. So I want to just think a little bit about the reflections of, of following the birth. And I, I want to now go from all of that doom and gloom, and we're not, we all know the doom and gloom, to actually the consideration that it's not all bad. And I was really surprised when we did our survey. So when we when we constructed our survey, we constructed a survey to pick up everything that was possibly bad. And when we sent it to the women who we'd interviewed to pilot it, they kept coming back and going, well, it's too negative. There's some good things here. Why don't you ask about some of the positive things? And thank goodness, that's why you pilot surveys, because very, very clearly there were some positive things. So here is a question we asked in our survey. Um, did you consider any of the following positive regarding giving birth during the COVID pandemic? Check all that apply. So overwhelmingly in the interviews and in the survey, it was fewer visitors in the postnatal period and fewer visitors at home and in hospital. That has come out overwhelmingly. It's come out in the interviews. It's come out with the midwife interviews. It's come out with the student midwife interviews. I would say the universal truth we've learned from this is that we have burst the bubble and we need to go back to protecting the bubble of making families after birth. And um, that was a surprise to everybody. Um, also getting more time with midwives. So midwives would say to us, I can go into a room and I don't have to go, oh, I'll come back because somebody's there. They had the time, it was uninterrupted. Um, so it was really interesting to see how widely that was identified as a positive. And the women said, you know, at first fewer visitors made me sad, but then I realized um, things were less rushed. I could focus on my baby, my husband worked from home and I had more support. We have done interviews with so many women who've said, oh my gosh, having my partner at home has been so nice because there is someone to leave the children with if you have to pop to the shops. There, he, he or she are, is home for the meal time, whereas before it would always be later and the kids would be in bed. So there have been some social changes that have actually been beneficial. And then women said, you know, time with no visitors in the hospital, just the husband and I turned out to be blessing in disguise. We had ample of time to bond with our baby and develop skills and comfort as new parents. Um, and then th this woman who said, I had a difficult relationship with my family and the restrictions meant I had more control. Um, and this was life changing and our results were better as uh, our relationship was better as a result. So another question we asked is overall, would you say um, what have been the positive 
uh, what have been the consequences of COVID on your household? And we asked that from extremely positive to extremely negative. And you can see, while yes, the weight is on the negative, most definitely, there is a substantial number of women who are responding to this saying this actually has been a positive time for them. Now, we do know that there seems to be a rising report from many countries now that preterm birth has gone down. We have to do a lot more looking at that. You know, are women calmer? Are women not so stressed by all of the rush and bustle? Are women actually doing the nesting that maybe is a very positive thing for them um, in their pregnancies? And, you know, this woman talks about slowing down, enjoying the simple things and time together. Having partners work at home has been really amazing. Can I just put a caveat around that? Of course, if there's domestic violence, this has been an incredibly dangerous time for women. So we've had rising reports of significant domestic violence. But where you have happy, stable families, this has been a positive thing. And, you know, me and my husband have discovered we're more resilient than we thought. We're a strong team. And I love this one. I fell in love with my husband during our hospital stay and we've connected deeper because we're the only ones we can see. That sounds funny after 14 years of marriage, but it's true. We've been able to connect deeper during the pregnancy and birth because it's just us. So I think 2020 is revealing really interesting things to humanity. And it's actually reminded us of what matters in this world, and that's each other. Media and social media is fascinating. It's both a curse and a blessing, and most of us who engage in it would have days where we feel it is both a curse and a blessing. But we actually wanted to find out what were women doing regarding media. And we, the average amount of time women were spending at the height of the pandemic watching news reports or social media was around three to four hours a day. And then I, I was just got this idea where I thought, I'm going to ask, have you consciously decided to reduce the time you spent? Because I found myself doing it. I thought, I'm saturated, I can't hear any more bad stuff, and I started shutting it off. And we were really interested to find out that a lot of women had consciously tried to distance themselves from the negativity out there. I want to talk a little bit about a paper who's, that has just literally been published in the last um, week that we've written in the Journal of, of um, Law and Medicine, and I've written this with two lawyers. Um, Bashi Kumar Hazard is the head of human rights. She's the director of human rights in childbirth, and Mary Tyrell is a longtime friend and a, and a brilliant uh, nursing lawyer, and she's um, deputy editor of this um of this um, journal. And so what we did is we, we wrote on how the COVID-19 um, pandemic highlights this ongoing pandemic of neglect and oppression when it comes to women's reproductive rights. And we addressed a whole lot of issues that you can see in the orange square over to the side. And I won't be going through all of those. It's a 10,000 word paper if you've got the stomach for it. So, we are in an extraordinary situation where we have to balance human rights and human life. And that is a really extraordinary situation. And there is a fine line between human rights and human and, the, and a human right to live. And we must be forever vigilant to keep our eye on that line. Because at the times like this, we can encroach into rights without good reason. And we can actually pull back advancements in humanity significantly. So I so much see this with, with um, childbearing women because I think that is always a great vulnerability. And the COVID pandemic has exposed this neglect of women's reproductive rights, um, provision of abortion services and maternity care are classic. And a lot of historic oppressions have resurfaced, which we discussed in this paper, the opposition to home birth, the closure of birth centres, the removal of abortion services, restricting support people, banning water birth, skin to skin, some of those things that I've talked about um, already. And the lack of support for home birth and private midwifery has really exposed the Achilles heel. And of course, we've in Australia got more women choosing to free birth because we haven't got enough midwives who can provide that service. And we've moved to an electronic medium, but I'm already hearing the murmurs of, well, let's keep going this way. We don't actually have to bring the women in. We can do it all over the phone. We can do it all remotely. And I'm very concerned that we do not have the evidence that that's best. We're looking at the bottom line. We're looking at cost. And the Good Matcha um, Institute did an amazing study that was published um, this year, looking at if you had a 10% decline in access to care in 132 low and middle income countries, 
there was an estimated um, outcome that would be an additional 15 million unintended pregnancies leading to unsafe abortions. That's a thousand additional deaths from that. Uh, 1.7 million women and 2.6 million newborns experiencing major complications leading to 28,000 more maternal deaths and 168,000 newborn deaths. And the Glance at Global Health comment that was published warned that maintaining reproductive health care during COVID pandemic is not a luxury, but a matter of life and death. And I think it'll be in the next year or two, we'll see the full fallout of what has happened during this time. And that's not even to mention the human rights abuses that goes on in some countries. And here's a woman who was turned away um, from eight hospitals being in labor. And at the first hospital, the doctor told her, I'll slap you if you take your mask off. So what happens in crisis and emergency situations like this is we give a mandate to very problematic behavior and we need to call it and we need to act on it. So why are women's rights the first to go? You know, in Australia, you can visit a pub, but your partner can't come to your antenatal appointments or scans. You can go shop at Ikea, but you can't have a second part, a birth partner at your baby's birth. And, and I find this quite extraordinary, the illogic. We can have a half-filled stadium in Australia for a football game. You know, we can have 100 people in pokey, playing the pokies in an RSL. And, you know, it really does make me think, you know, we've got a lot of white old men making decisions about women's business. And I think we have to constantly call it. We have to challenge it. Now, I'm not anti, I am not an anti-mask person. I, I, I absolutely believe in, in the, the logic and the evidence around it. I also believe in, the, in, in lockdowns when they're needed and in restricting our contact with other people. But I think there's some illogic here that for me smacks of patriarchy and agenda and bias. And what are the ripples of trauma that will come out of that time? And that's something we're going to try and assess as well in our study. But here's this woman who said, I gave birth alone. I was then in hospital with my newborn alone. This isn't something someone should feel forced into doing alone. So what can we learn? What are the lessons to learn for next time? And these are some of my kind of top ones coming out of this, this study we've been doing. Childbirth, a, a physiological, social, psychological, cultural and spiritual event caught up in a medicalized net. And hence, so often ends up in a position it should not be. Continuity of care is a buffer and we need to start to really look at its potential in emergency situations. If you don't have the evidence, don't make the rule. Bottom line, be cautious, but don't go making laws because you just think it might be a good idea. Community-based care should be prioritised, not minimised. This is when primary health care comes into its own. This is when a public health strategy is absolutely fundamental. Telehealth's great, but for whom and, who sh and how should we use it? And I think we need to do a lot more research on that. And beware the change that now stays without good evidence of benefit and acceptability. And I want to end on a positive note. And I want to just say to you all, go gently, my friends. Um, listen to the birds, feel the breeze on your skin, the sun on your face, and let the moonbeams dance in your eyes. The world is still on her axis and the seasons are changing. Now is just now. It is not forever. Tomorrow is coming. Try to focus on those positive things. We will get through this and we will be wiser and stronger, I believe, as a society if we're willing to take the lessons from this. And I want to end with this picture because my dear, dear friend Fiona Haynes is online. She actually got in, registered to be, come onto this program to listen to me speak. Fiona is my mum's best friend and she is one of the original midwives from the actual Lunatus house from Call the Midwives and she worked with Jennifer Work and my mum and her worked together in the Docklands of England. And this is us going and finding the real um, Nonata's house, which is actually St. Frideswide's mission a few years ago, knocking on the door, going in, and she showed me all of the rooms um, that they used to live in. It's now actually a, uh, a, a housing place for, for homeless people, I think, and, and disadvantaged people. And we spent the most gorgeous day together. But she's my youngest, oldest friend, and... Um, I just wanted to end by saying, hi, Fiona, I love you. And one of the worst things about 2020 has not been able to go into England, spend time having cups of tea, watching Midsummer murders and uh, going to see the beautiful flowers and gardens of England. And that's it for me.
Thank you. So we have a session now on common sense childbirth, improving outcomes for women and children, lessons from the United States of America. And our presenter is Jenny Joseph, the founder and executive director of Common Sense Childbirth and creator of the JJ Way. So coming from a different country, coming from a different time zone, and probably coming from a slightly different angle over to Jenny Joseph. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to participate in this amazing, amazing event. Um, wow, yes. So I've titled my um, presentation, Saving Lives. And um, there's a reason for that. And as I go through, I'm hoping that I can um, engage you all in understanding why I've said such a um, dramatic thing at the beginning, also transforming maternal health care in America's maternal toxic zones. And again, just wanting to draw your attention to there's such a problem here, um, often not spoken about, often very hidden, and that COVID-19 has kind of just brought to the fore, but it was already here. So I consider that we're almost at this point, we're in our own pandemic, if you will, and that we have had an ongoing issue. So just a quick background about myself. I'm British trained, I'm British born and raised, um, um, immigrated to the States in 1989, but I was a British trained midwife as a direct entrant back in the day. Um, there's my picture back in 1981 when I was graduating. Um, and I've been here, like I say, it's going to be 31 years. And it's been quite the experience, let me tell you. Came into Orlando, um, I met an amazing man, we fell in love, we did the long distance romance, came back, got married, came with an oblivious mindset, just, well, oh, I'll go get a job as a midwife because I know Americans have babies. Hmm, that didn't quite work out. So over these 31 years, I've been really fighting a fight. I feel sometimes very lonely in that fight because um, Americans don't really have midwifery as their main practice, as their main, um, maternity care providers, we are still fringe. We are still considered, oh, a midwife, ah. Um, and we are also fighting from a perspective of a monopoly of um, the maternity care services through obstetrics. And um, so I've worked hard to bring maternity care through the midwifery model to the forefront. And in the Orlando, Central Florida area, um, we've established some midwifery practices that have made a big difference. And luckily, um, I think beginning to make some headway, getting some um, response, getting some information out there and getting some notoriety about what we do too. Um, here's, I was featured in the New York Times uh, 2018, um, talking about the work, again, about making pregnancy safer for women. So, you know, I mean, here's me with a transfer case. I want to share this picture because this picture sort of captured what it's like for me working as a midwife. I have a freestanding birthing center where I see healthy, low-risk women who choose out-of-hospital birth. And that's not very common in the United States either. And then, um, and that grew out of a home birth practice that I started when I first arrived. And I also have a clinic, which I call the Easy Access Clinic, where I see women who are more marginalized, who are not necessarily low-risk, who are in a system that has them trapped and stuck and unable to access the quality and the correct care that they need. And I do almost like a midwifery triage for those women. So this picture was the picture that showed me after a transport, this mama, you can't really see underneath all the blankets and towels, but she just pushed out a 10 pound enormous child vaginally um, due to having had um, a, you know, a timely transfer, a necessary transfer. We did need some support to finish this birth, but um, I have worked hard to establish relationships with hospitals. So I don't have privileges myself at the hospital. I'm not allowed to deliver the baby at the hospital, but I have over the years built strong relationships locally such that I can come in with my patients and do the continuity piece here. So you see her husband, you see this look of triumph as this mother has received well, treated well and supported to fulfill on her birth plan that did go a slight, slightly awry, but look at the outcome. But let me go back to what's happening in the United States. Let's be clear what's happening here. In general, um, the public health goals are put out every 10 years, every decade, and the government calls them healthy people goals. And so as I learned about those goals, as I got used to the American life, um, realized that these healthy people goals were quite lofty. 
And so they should be, because this is always what we're looking for. So, for example, the Healthy People 2010, they um, overarchingly aim to increase quality in years of life, but they call for the elimination of health disparities. You can imagine how thrilled I was to learn about that, because at that point, I'd have been in the country a decade as well, and I hadn't seen anything along the lines that was looking to eliminate health disparities. The Healthy People 2020 goals showed up and they were expanded. Oh, we're not only going to eliminate, but now we're going to achieve health equity while we're at it and improve the health of all groups. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. But somehow couldn't see that in practice. So as I said, I was in Florida, I'm still in Florida. And um, I just show, wanted to show this slide because this helps us see how Florida and the US 2010 objectives matched up. These measures were for adequate or adequate plus prenatal care. That in and of itself gives me pause. What on earth does that mean? But they were measuring it. Um, Preterm births, low birth weight births and infant mortality. This is the overall population, all races, all ethnicities, all people. And so Florida and the United States didn't compare that well. So for example, for preterm births, the goal was for 7.6, but we were at 13.8. You know, low birth weight was five, we were at 8.7. This is very common and this was what we were looking at. I also want to point out though, but by 2020, it looked like we were making some progress here. Look how nicely these balance, right? Like, oh, you see the big gaps, you see the disparities, but oh, we're getting it together. We're catching up with ourselves. But I also want to point out how figures and statistics can skew how we see and how we perceive how well we're doing or not. So for example, all of a sudden the adequate, adequate prenatal care, adequate plus prenatal care, we were almost neck and neck. But look, the bar moved, went to 80, and we also changed the parameter. Same with preterm, suddenly the goal was 11.4. And so at 13.6, we weren't that far away. The low birth weight goal was suddenly 7.8. And so again, we weren't that far away. And infant mortality was neck and neck. I point you back to how it looked before and how it looked by 2020. I haven't put the 2030 goals up because I've got nothing to say at this point on these goals. Another way to look at what's going on in the states, and this graph is just from the um, Orange County, which is a, the um, county that I live in, in Orlando. Um, it shows preterm births in Orange County from back in 2000 to 2006. It doesn't matter what it shows, because without even looking at the legend, you would know that the purple line at the top is going to be black, the black race, because we have always got that much of a disparity between any ill, whether it's heart disease, cancer, you name it. There is going to be a line which is going to be markedly different, higher, larger, greater, and it's going to be black people because this is what's going on in America. So put another way, our babies are dying. That's what's going on. Um, for as long as I've been here, I've been able to say at least twice as many black babies are being born too soon, too small, too sick. But in actuality, in many areas and jurisdictions, it could be as many as three to four times. And while I got here, we were focused on infant mortality in the beginning years. We began to realize, oh, hold on, they have mothers. The mothers are so ill and sick that the babies are being born premature, low birth weight. And of course, women are dying too. And in the last 10 years, I would say we focused on maternal mortality finally. This picture is um, from 2010, we were at Capitol Hill with a briefing with Amnesty International, which was the first group to bring the maternal death, um, the maternal um, crisis to the American um, recognition, or at least saying it out loud. And um, the, they published Deadly Delivery, very important um, art, um, writing that helped us understand how bad it was. So two to three women die daily in the United States, about 700 or so a year. Not a large amount when you compare, compare to developing nations, but this is not a developing nation. This is not a developing nation. This is unconscionable that the um, numbers are so high. But here's what's really important to understand. We say, we say about 50,000 or maybe 60,000 near misses happen every year, people who nearly die. That is a difficult number to capture because if you're nearly dead, you're not really counted. If you leave your maternity experience from the hospital through the ER, through the ICU, through the cardiac care unit, you're not counted. If you don't speak out, you're not counted because even though you have the pain, the trauma from nearly dying, um, actually you're still alive. We have a problem here. 
And of course, the disparity is worth mentioning. Three to four times as many African-American women are dying as white women um, due to um, maternal related issues. In certain areas, certain states, as New York, for example, 12 times as many. Hmm? It's really outrageous. So of course we just blame the women. Well, of course, you know, it's these social determinants of health. Oh, these are the maternal toxic areas. It's because of the poverty, it's because of the stress, it's because of the violence, it's because, because, because. But in actuality, I, I coined this phrase maternal toxic because I think it sums up how mothers and um, their babies are at risk wherever they may be. So this is a picture of that same woman I showed you earlier who um, just before she delivered was, you know, received well, like I say, supported, and she was able to have a straightforward vaginal delivery of a potentially complicated case. And it, for her, the hospital was not maternal toxic. But this woman I'm gonna show you now, she didn't have that same experience. This is a series of pictures of a woman that she actually delivered en route in the ambulance. She was in my clinic coming in for um, a prenatal checkup at 38 weeks, looking miserable, complaining that she'd been up all night, and didn't know what to do with herself. When I checked her, she was eight centimeters. Um, the women who choose my clinic also choose hospital birth. They know they're gonna be delivered by the physicians when they reach the hospital. The midwives don't follow from my practice. So she was so close, I said, let me ride with her in the ambulance just in case. And sure enough, baby was born en route. So you see her newly delivered, looking quite shocked. As soon as we got to the hospital, I insisted on getting the baby skin to skin, which we were able to do at that point. And you see how she's there transitioning, getting a little bit more accustomed to what happened, still figuring it out. Importantly, you see the baby also just doing beautifully, pinking up, coming round. And you see this mom begin to smile and relax. I'm pointing this out because first of all, this was a choose, chosen hospital birth. She wanted a hospital birth. She wasn't expecting to be in labor in my clinic. I just happened to see her at the time she was about to transition. Why this is important is that after this picture was taken, she was taken upstairs to the maternity floor. The fight was ensuing because she still had the placenta inside her and the physicians were arguing about who was going to deliver the placenta because that tied into who was going to be able to bill for the birth. That happened around this woman who was newly delivered, who was just settling out of her trauma of having delivered practically, you know, in the ambulance on the way in. And then what happened then really encapsulates for me how quick the maternal toxicity kicks in. She wanted to breastfeed the baby. The baby had been skin to skin since we got her delivered. The nurse took the baby and said, the baby needs a bottle. Mother said, okay. Didn't have enough time to process or understand what was going on. It was madness. In that moment, that changed from being a straightforward, helpful environment into what I call maternal toxicity. Different women being treated differently. The outcomes are impacted by that. That breastfeeding experience, that breastfeeding relationship never got established. So quality in perinatal care, what does it really look like? Look how they're measuring. Oh, adequate prenatal care. What does that mean? How many visits she had? How often she came into the building? How often somebody put hands on her or didn't put hands on her? Is it services? Is it interventions? Is it the type of practitioner or is it the will to provide that quality care? Recent work out of um, um, British Columbia, um, Professor Vidam, I know she presented yesterday, that look at what we've discovered in looking at the overall experience of mothers in America. One in six women are ex mis experiencing mistreatment in the United States. This is something that has really shocked us. Um, people of color, of course, we know are experiencing more mistreatment in birth. Um, indigenous women suffer just as much as black women, but the numbers are much lower and the, the studies are not as rife because of the smaller populations. But indigenous, indigenous, indigenous and native women are suffering. Hispanic women are suffering, black women are suffering. The top four types of mistreatment, being shouted at, Violation of privacy, threatening to withhold treatment, refusing requests for help. This happens all day, every day in the United States, in hospitals, in environments which are supposed to be safe environments. So how does that impact what I do? And what does culturally safe perinatal care look like? 
I am servicing more women of color than not. In the Easy Access Clinic, we see an average of up to a thousand women annually through the clinics. People choose Easy Access Clinics because first of all, they can get access to them. They choose them because they think hospital birth is the way to have a baby. And we are not here trying to change that um, thought or approach. We are here to support that because we know that listening to women is key. And so we provide prenatal and we provide postpartum care for these women. But what we've done is we've incorporated culturally safe care throughout any of the interactions that we have with them. We make sure that we're providing trauma-informed care because we recognize that that's the only tool we have to mitigate these outcomes, to impact the systems that are going to continue to provide care that the way that they have set up to provide care. Additionally, we've looked at providing trauma-informed care for the staff. It has been quite the journey to transition my British midwife head into providing midwifery services in America because we are fighting um, similar issues, marginalization, lack of professional autonomy, re respect, power, just the same way that our families are fighting those same structural um, um, issues. So trauma-informed care mitigates the structural environment and what I call the pop-up toxicity, the toxicity that impacted Serena Williams um, in her birth experience. Her story is pretty well renowned through the world. She suffered during her postpartum with pulmonary embolism. She knew she was feeling something was wrong. She kept advocating for herself. She nearly died because no one was listening. She was in a hospital. How could a hospital become a maternal toxic zone? It became toxic for her because the response to her, the embedded ability and the condoned behavior where implicit bias, where racism, classism, and sexism impacts your care and your support to the point that it literally can take your life. So I created this model, I called it the JJ Ways because I didn't know what else to call it. And I'm JJ and, um, you know, it was just a way of trying to essentially break into the system and see if there was a way to um, mitigate and change these outcomes. Um, like I said, I got here in 89. It took me till 94 before I was able to get licensed. I was the first foreign trained midwife in Florida that got a, mid a midwifery license and was able to practice as an independent midwife. Um, what I set out to do when I kept coming up against this brick wall that was barrier after barrier that said, no, you cannot do what you want to do. That's not what we do here. That's not how we do it. And you know, basically we're not gonna work with you. We set out to figure out if we could create a culture or an environment supporting all pregnant women, pregnant people, wherever they wanted to birth, with whomever they wanted to, to birth, and however they wanted to have their care. And the question we posed was, could it make a difference to these outcomes? And we measured the health of the baby by the gestational age and the birth weight and the breastfeeding rates as well. And we really started working with um, this basic fundamental premise. We know every woman wants a healthy baby. We know that every woman wants a healthy baby and every woman deserves one. These black and white pictures that you're seeing, um, these are pictures of patients of ours over the years that we actually turned into a coffee table book. And um, they are real folk from around the way. These are not models. So let me just reiterate, this JJ Way model has these four cornerstones. Our goal is to make sure that every woman has access to care. Every woman has the connections that she needs. Every woman and her family have the knowledge and understanding to become empowered in this experience so that they can survive, so that they can thrive. These were not medical or clinical protocols. These had to come up in the face of those medical and clinical protocols, which seemingly, when impact, um, imp implemented from a place of bias, from a place of power um, dynamic, from a place of um, struggle, were harming and killing mothers and babies. We learned that we could implement these pieces very simply, just by listening to women, just by trusting them. 
just by agreeing with them that they already know what to do and supporting that. And it was that simple. I had to come up with something that didn't cost any money because I didn't have any money. As I was building a practice, I had to become an entrepreneur because we're talking about capitalism here. We're talking about um, power here. We're not just talking about healthcare. So when I saw the title for the work that we're doing over these three days and the, you know, the recovery piece came up for me and I thought about it um, again, a picture of one of the mothers in the practice, you know, how have we implemented recovery? Because we were always in a pandemic. Our pandemic is racism. Our pandemic is classism. Yes, now we have Black Lives Matter come forward again, but before Black Lives Matter, we had um, civil rights, we had the Black Panthers, we had Black people for decades, centuries saying something is wrong, this is not right, this is not equitable. That resilience is there. That resilience has always been there because we're still here and we're still fighting. You see those photos that we took, we were trying to illustrate the power of healthy black women. What does that look like? When I put my book out, people hadn't even seen such pictures. They had no idea. But you see the big belly. This is what we're always about, the full-term baby, which is supposedly hard to do in America. If you're black, you're likely to have a preterm baby. How is that normal? So sustainability is what we're still doing. We're still fighting to sustain these practices and to do this work. And we do that by creating what I call the perinatal safe spots. So the safe spots incorporate the four cornerstones of the JJ way, but the safe spots aren't all clinics. They certainly aren't all midwives because there's not enough of us. The safe spots are areas where whatever person or people have declared them to be so, those people are standing with pregnant women and their families, pregnant people and saying, listen, we will hear you and understand what you need and we will fight with you to get it, to help you get there. So safe spots are run by doulas, safe spots are run by childbirth educators, lactation educators, safe spots could be run by doctors. They are in clinics, they are in existing social services offices. They can be, and they can be in your living room. La Leche League started in somebody's living room all those years ago. I'm in Orlando, as I said, and we utilize this model. This is a midwifery model of care that, again, patient-centered, woman-centered, family-centered, culturally congruent care, accessible care with all of the psychosocial support that is needed. So again, the birthplace is my freestanding birthing center, which has been open since 2003. The Easy Access Women's Health Clinics have been running since 2005. And those clinics, again, we see most of the women in the practices are coming through those clinics because most of American women want to deliver in the hospital. But again, we found a way to create safe, respectful care. We provide and support that dignity. We bring compassion to this work and women oftentimes are in tears, are in breakdown when they get to us and they explain, I've never experienced anything like this. This is what it looks like when you provide care that way. If you might notice the thighs on these children, look at these chunky babies, these beautiful babies that are breastfed and are supported. This is one of our group meetings that we hold at our clinics. These are not typical pictures that you expect to see in the United States. So this is a common sense approach. We're looking at community-based maternity medical homes, if you will, creating safe spots where we can. We put clinical providers in those safe spots, but where we can't, we keep people in those safe spots who are going to be working towards working with whichever clinicians those women have, if any. We have situations in the United States where women don't have a medical provider because they've been turned away. Oh, you're uninsured, you can't pay, you don't have resources, we don't like the way you look. Oh, you're too far advanced in this pregnancy, so now you're too high risk for us to take you. All kinds of crazy reasons that are causing harm. So part of this common sense approach is keeping a reality check recognizing the disparities are real, recognizing that it costs money to get maternity care in the United States. And if you have none, you will not get that care. So our allies have to be real allies and they have to understand the work 
that we're doing and why. I'm grateful that our local hospitals work with me as allies. They do take my patients and know why I'm doing what I'm doing and know what I'm doing and support it. But we also need to build a workforce so that we have providers who are willing to work this way through open to having their clinics um, and open to having um, their, their practices transform into being this kind of approach, being open, having access, regardless of insurance status or financial status, having access regardless of people's home situations or their ability to eat that pristine diet that you've recommended for them. Open to working with them where they are. And our sustainability is only as much as we can bill or as often as we can make um, the insurance pay us, which is oftentimes not very easy. The amount of patients that I've seen and babies I've delivered that I've never gotten paid for, it's really sad that that's the truth, but it is the truth. Again, the goal is transformation. So this is an old slide. This is from 2010. And um, this was one of the um, aspirations and goals and dreams that I put down to see if I could get there. And I'm happy to say we have, we've done most of these things and we continue to add more services. But the easy access clinic services, we're providing, like I said, the prenatal postpartum interconceptional and family planning. We're also doing what I call medical triage. There are women that are way too high risk for me as a midwife, but can't access high risk care without being referred from a practice. So we pass through, we make a way for women to start their care so they can at least get their lab work done and their ultrasound done before we make that referral to high risk so that someone can pick them up and continue their care. We um, collaborate with the hospitals. We do health navigation. We've learned all the systems. We've learned all the hoops. We know the bureaucratic hurdles and we help women bypass those. The birthing services, I do deliver at the birthing center. We deliver uh, anywhere from 60 to 100 women annually through the birthing center who have a natural birth, who choose water birth, but not everybody wants that. And so we do have a smaller practice from that. But those, again, who want the hospital are more than um, encouraged and supported to choose hospital. And we do provide doula support when we can. And then we do a lot of outreach and education. We do home visits. We do support groups. We do community-based mentoring. We have doulas. We have breastfeeding counselors. A lot of these things had to grow up around and in, instead of while we were supporting women who want to continue to use the system. Back in 2006, we did our first study. I wanted to see if anything that I was doing was really making a difference. We already kind of knew it was, but this was a hundred people enrolled prospectively. And we said, let's just see what happens on the other end. And look what happened. I point out the particular stark um, statistic here of the black women in the study. At that time, 21% of black women in Orange County in 2006 were having a preterm birth. 20 percent of people were having a preterm birth. That year, our 100 women, out of the 100 women that we enrolled, the black women, not one preterm birth, not one Hispanic baby was born premature. This happened based on the model I've just described. We didn't have any fancy obstetric stuff. We didn't have any technology. We didn't have, we just were trying to do the care. So by 2010, we'd eliminated the racial disparity. 100, um, easy access women were enrolled. This is not the birth center women. These were not the low risk straightforward women. These were the women with complicated cases, marginalized women. 95% of the babies weighed an average seven and a half pound. 95% of the women delivered at 39 weeks. Recovery. Resilience. This mama had started with us when she had been using um, crack cocaine when she started. She went into institutional care. She stayed in residential care through her pregnancy. I still remember to this day, I went with her when she had a C-section, she had a planned C-section. And I remember her telling the physician, I feel it, I feel it. And she started crying. And the anesthesia team said, oh, you, no, you don't, you're okay. She told them she could feel her cesarean. They continued anyway. I'll never forget her. Sustainability. This is one of our teen moms with one of the chunky babies, which we always seem to have these juicy, juicy babies. We have found ways to sustain this practice, but it hasn't been easy because we still remain outside the system. 
here's one of our um, doulas working with a, a couple. Um, we do a lot of work in our waiting room. We, we provide a lot of resources, wraparound supports. The, we also run our clinics in Spanish and in Portuguese. Um, these are some of the staff from the Easy Access Clinic. These women who support me in the work that I do as a midwife. As far as I'm concerned, they're all midwives. They provide midwifery model care. Um, from left to right, June is a peer counselor and supporter. She keeps our clinics running by providing the outreach education and maintaining community liaisons. Megan is now um, just finished her master's degree. She's heading towards nurse midwifery. To Katrina in, with the pink stethoscope was a medical assistant um, and has been with me um, 15 years. And Alex is also a medical assistant. Um, these amazing women have embraced the model, have joined in with us and helped us to bring these outcomes. We um, have studies that have proven this work is making a difference. In 2014, um, we proved statistically significant for longer gestational periods and lower preterm birth rates for women of color in the practice using the same model I've described. Um, in 2017, we did a, an evaluation of the maternity center to see, again, what's happening here. Is this a model that can be replicated? Is this a model that should be replicated? Once again, zero disparities in preterm births. We managed that year, 2017, to show, and there were about 240 women in this study, um, that we, at that point, the black rate for women um, having preterm births was lower than the white counterparts in Orange County and in Florida and across the nation. Remember those? Okay, so the solutions are really clear to me, um, clear to people who believe and support what we're doing, I think clear to midwives around the world who understand the midwifery model of care and the power of the midwifery model of care. It is protective in maternal toxic zones and in situations. Um, if you're willing to do work this way, you will make a difference. We've been able to make sure that we provide access to safe quality care, that it's appropriate level care, that it's at any site with any choice that the mother has. But we also want to make sure that the providers have access to being able to work this way, to break down these historical and structural harms and these barriers that have caused and continue to perpetuate these poor outcomes. We know the providers need access to cultural humility training and to implicit bias training. And we know that students need access to scholarships and grants for training purposes. We need more student midwives. Um, we need student midwives of color. We need um, a community um, of uh, providers of color that can serve all areas and disciplines. We organize on a national level. We're building a movement to birth a more just and loving world through this perinatal task force that I've formed. And we are proudly, I'm thrilled to be able to announce that we are now accredited as a private midwifery school, the first and only black owned midwifery school in the United States of America. So this is what you get when you put together access, connection, knowledge and empowerment for everyone. Everyone, this is equity. Here are some of the babies over the years. We had a reunion last year and it was really amazing. Um, we managed to get this picture captured and I love this picture. So many of these people in this picture um, started with me as home birth mothers and families and now um, through the birth center, through the Easy Access Clinic and through the reach of our work, we've been able to get to what I say is the road to recovery. The resilience has always been there we're working on the sustainability. At the end of the day, this is about human rights. And so I'd be more than happy to take your questions and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was an absolutely tremendous uh, presentation and fascinating as well uh, for the degree to which, I mean, the word that jumped out at me was the work that you do in navigation, yes. navigating uh, women through the process, identifying all the risk elements. Um, interestingly, we've had a note from uh, Lena Duncan saying that they've noticed the same sort of variations in behaviours and service uh, provided in trusts in the UK. So, you know, this is not a peculiar issue. I no. have to say the figures, and, and in Britain, we are struggling with the five times uh, the number of deaths uh, for black women compared to white women that, that came out in the um, uh, 
uh, Chief Nurse's report and the OBS and Gynae are working on it. But what's interesting to me, just say a bit more about the, the battle that you've had really in the professional world to identify the role of the kind of outreach midwifery that you're doing, if that's a, a fair mm. description. Yes, it is outreach midwifery. I mean, honestly, it's like being in a disaster zone. Um, that's why I said it felt, I feel like the pandemic has been here. This is, yes, brought forward now. COVID-19 has made us more aware of it. And we now are like just recognizing that, yes, when it impacts everybody, then, oh, we do really want to pay attention. But this is very, um, it's very difficult to implement because in America, the business of medicine is what reigns. Capitalism is the part that has to be acknowledged. So we are up against a, a system where money is key. And so midwifery doesn't fit into that model in the same way as it does where there's universal access to healthcare. Health is not a human right. Health has to be afforded. And those that are not able to afford are ostracized. So the navigation began from the place of, first of all, understanding even as a provider, how do I navigate? How do I get access? And I did not gain access. I had to fight to be able to be licensed and to work. And I'm still outside of the system. Even though we are very collaborative and we've worked hard to build those relationships, that's not mandated. It's if you feel like it, it's if you like this midwife, it's if you prefer to, you know, affiliate or not, you don't have to. And that leaves us in a real tenuous situation. And then on top of that, midwifery, when we're serving marginalized people, technically, we immediately go out of our scope. Because unfortunately, in the United States, the marginalized folk are the people who are becoming high risk, not from physiological risk, but from the impact of social risk, racism, classism, um, power, um, those risks, weather and harm and cause the um, stress related manifestations of poor outcomes. I say that because I know that when we are able to work with women, especially long term through the per perinatal times, those risks are mitigated. We aren't seeing preeclamptic women, therefore we're not seeing prematurity. We aren't seeing diabetic women, therefore we're not having, you know, babies that can't be born. We're all of the issues that seem to culminate by getting women to term are mitigated, even though they continue to exist. So we've learned that if we know how to navigate the systems on behalf of and alongside of the women and their families, we can help lower the stress that those barriers are, are adding and therefore physiologically impact the outcome. I've always asked this question and I don't think we'll ever get the answer. What is it about being kind or being decent or supporting and, and in, encouraging the, you know, respect and dignity? What is it about that that has that cervix locked tight? That without that, the cervix would open, the baby would be born at 28 weeks. How do you have such impact on physiology based on these non-tangible pieces, which without the effort and work on our end to figure out how to navigate and help women through, they would not get the benefit of the respectful care or the listening ear that we provide. And when with you, when one you, or the, they can't go one without the other. They are one, two punch, they belong together. When are you connecting with women in the cycle of their pregnancy? Right now, because of the years of work and because of the you know, outreach that we have done, we get them early. People are calling me five weeks, six weeks because they know we will answer that call. Everywhere else you're shut out. There's this sort of strange tension between getting into providers who will turn you away at the drop of a hat if you're 20 weeks. Oh, you're too far advanced, it's too late, too high risk, go away. But yet when you call at you know, 10, 12 weeks, oh no, we don't wanna see you yet. And so, all of these sort of strange, perverse barriers and hoops, bureaucratic hurdles are preventing women getting access. So the access that we provide is that we will pick up the phone or we'll answer your text as early as we can. And we start with you immediately. When you reach out, you're in, there isn't a barrier. And that has been the biggest piece. And the fact that we've done that has been ridiculed, has been, we're considered a nuisance because 
leaving it barrier free like that means we're not fighting with women about money. We're not fighting about insurance. Rather, we're saying, come on and we'll triage you and help you figure out how to get that insurance, how to get um, onto um, a Medicaid plan, how to afford it, or even to agree with you that you just plain can't afford it. I had a homeless woman 38 weeks call us last week. She'd been seen at the emergency room at the triage department at the hospital and told, well, Jenny Joseph might take you. So she called me because no one else will take her. She is relegated to keep walking the streets until she goes into labor, at which point they will tut tut, roll their eyes and give her a hard time about presenting in labor without having had prenatal care. Mm. This is how it's completely, it's just cruel so in so many bits, ways. The only bits that are successfully covered by the Obamacare reforms are uh, the actual birth or is this simply other facilities gaming the system to avoid what they regard as difficult cases or, yes. or not maximized billing cases? The latter. And sadly, not everybody takes the um, insurance, particularly the one that most low income people are on, which is Medicaid. They mm -hmm. don't take it. They don't want to be bothered with it. It doesn't pay enough. It's a headache. And that's another structural deep system that impacts and causes, as far as I'm concerned, all of these harms. Um, the causes of death are not what you would expect. Oh, hemorrhage, um, high blood pressure. Yes, those are a result of. But mm. deep down, the structural reasons, the root causes are these social and um, societal ways of being this capitalistic ways of being that say you don't belong if you don't have money, if you don't have power. And that's but a problem. Interestingly, I mean, I think from the presentations that we've had earlier today um, about some marginalized communities in the UK, that even if you can have a, f a free universal system, uh, yes. there will still be actually a great many of the barriers that you described, we heard about Somali women, we heard about, different, we've, there's a lot of identification about the problems of Bangladeshi women uh, yes. and their access to service, not just language, but the ability of the services to reach out to them. And even where they have a very diverse workforce in parts of London, they can get it right. In other places, they're, they seem to be getting it wrong. And it's interestingly, the, the outreach and the wraparound, in other words, not regarding yes. the, the clinical issues as separate from their social and cultural and race issues. That seems to be the message from, uh, from your, uh, your program. Yes, absolutely. Cultural congruence is key, but also we as providers have to figure out where we can get off our high horse, move the ego aside and come back to what we all committed to. Mm -hmm. As midwives, we've always centered the patient but now these are the times where we learn and understand differently that to center the patient means move yourself out from the middle as well. Midwife-centered care is not safe care. Agency-centered care, hospital-centered care is not safe care. Culturally congruent care where the mother family, mother baby family are centered is where the safety starts and finishes. Once we acknowledge that, we can then as providers embrace other team players. The people that most, um, that the women most connect with are my medical assistants, my peer paraprofessionals, my, um, you know, auxiliary um, staff. They're not that bothered about what the midwife has to say or not. It's not about me. It's not about even what I'm offering in my clinical practice. It's about we come here because you will talk to us. You treat us right. There's no judgment. And anybody who has a heart can provide care that way. And it's not about these deep, you know, we must have these competencies and we must have these skills. Not necessarily. Not and to get what we need. You're, you're also, obviously, from the presentation, quite active on policy and uh, you get yes. recognition in the clinical journals. How does your work connect with the kind of work we were hearing from uh, Neil Shah at Harvard, where his wide studies have been identifying that uh, a mother giving birth in the United States today is 50% more likely to die than her mother uh, because of, if you like, this medicalization, the failure to provide the kind of wraparound that you're describing that means that 
the mother and the baby are fit and ready to be born safely and uh, to prosper afterwards. How, do you, how are you connecting with the other groups that are yeah. like, like Neil's? Um, yes, we are quite active and, you know, um, um, I really appreciate Neil's work and his colleagues. We, you know, there's a lot of uh, movement, if you will, going on where we're really keen to get to policymakers. So, for example, I'm um, one of the advisory board members for the Black Maternal Health Caucus, which is a congressional caucus that is working on um, bills. We have nine bills in a omnibus package, which are addressing um, these um, poor outcomes, maternal health outcomes, particularly for Black women. But across the board, we're seeing that, you know, the, the consumers are also mobilizing. Um, there's definitely a, a lot more interest um, about birth trauma, birth um, obstetric violence. Um, you know, we realize that we've got power in the consumers and the women are speaking out. But remember, we're still couched inside of hospital is where you deliver and there's nothing that you can do about a mindset that says that these services are providing safe care, even though the truth is now coming out. And not to say that all hospitals don't provide safe care, but we have known about the impact of cesareans. And yeah, there's a little bit of a slowing, but not anywhere near enough because part of the purpose of capital capitalism in, in healthcare is you need to sell services. You need to fill the NICU, the, the neonatal intensive care unit, the special care baby unit has to be full of babies to be, you know, lucrative. And so whose babies are in there? The babies of the marginalized. They're full of black and brown babies in the, in the NICUs. The women who are more likely to get cut are of color. The women who are more likely to die are of color, are, are low income, are marginalized. This is unfortunately part of the process. So we can do all the policies, um, make, change all the policies, make all of these um, you know, safety bundles and trainings and all of this, but be clear, the hospital is run by people who are trying to make money and you cannot take away the services that make the most money and expect a hospital to be able to continue even to survive they will argue that that will kill their hospital okay jenny on that uh, forceful <laughs> point uh, yeah. we need to bring it to an end thank you very much for your contribution i'm sure you'll get a lot thank of you. feedback as this goes round. and i can see from uh, some of the online media and things that lots of people recognize uh, some of what you're describing as failings that are common across other mm -hmm. systems perhaps not quite as brutally and sharp as you experience them in the United States. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And uh, no doubt we'll be in touch. Well done. Yes, thank you so much. Great.